Christian Wagner, and I'm the Militant Thomist, and I'm here today with Eric Yabara. How are you doing, Eric? I'm doing excellent, man. Thank you for having me on again. I think this is the second time or third time. I can't remember. But Second time. Last time we were talking about the sacrifice of the Mass. That's right. That's right. Um, I've been noticing some of your material lately, and it seems like you're uh, talking a lot of high-level stuff, so um, I'm excited to be on. Thank you. I try my hardest. I've been thinking about getting into a little bit of the dogmatic aspects of justification. I feel like um, I'm not sure. I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, but I feel like when I do see people's arguments against the Catholic view of justification, it comes from a place of uh, grave misunderstanding. Yeah. Um, and, and also it comes from a place of uh, poor modes of argumentation. It's uh, just usually both uh, sometimes one or the other. Um, it, it's, it's just the same, same old stuff that I, I've, I've read from authors hundreds of years ago and, uh, have been talked about, but, uh, I, uh, I, I was really excited when I saw that you were, uh, that you came out with a book, especially on Romans, because that is one of my, my favorite books of sacred scripture. Yes. And I did put the, the link in the description below. Thank you. It's on Amazon. Let me, let me pull it up. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, that's just the locus classicus uh, of uh, on in the debate between Catholics and Protestants is the Book of Romans. I mean, I, I just and you know even before Protestant uh, reforms came in, Romans was cherished by a number of the Church Fathers. So it, it, it's a book that didn't even gain its prestige just after Luther. Mm -hmm. You know, it's. It's a book that has uh it's just my it's my I, I, if i was stranded on an island and i needed to have one book of the bible i always say i i would i would have to have the psalms but yes. the second one would ne by necessity be the book of romans um so it has that pride of place in my perspective so when you were when you were researching uh for this book how, how long have you been researching for this book i'm i'm curious yeah, that's a good question. So I could I could literally say that uh, this research goes back to 2005. Uh, that's when I started getting really deep into defending the Protestant teaching, and uh, I was reading all of the the normal recommendations, um, Puritans. I was I got into Luther, Calvin. Um, got I eventually. I really found uh, a, a good place in uh, Gerhardus Voss, uh, mm -hmm. Herman Ritterboss. Um, and when I, when I was a Protestant and I linked in the um, eschatology and soteriology as both um, having to do with justification, this is something that George Eldon Ladd wrote. He, he made it more uh, of a common talk in English scholarship with his book on the kingdom of God, the already, the not yet, the new mm -hmm. creation breaking into the present, mm -hmm. that whole motif had kind of dropped um, from some of the Protestant uh, scholarship on the subject of justification. What well, got resurrected because some of the, some of that intaking from Dutch reform thought from Voss, and then really, uh, you, you know, looking back to the older uh reformers on this um it, i started to defend this you know the, the protestant doctrine i was reading um 
some of the new perspective material. I was arguing against that. Um, I, I developed a good email relationship with a number of scholars who were in the field, like D.A. Carson, Douglas Moo, Stephen Westerholm. Um, there's, there's just a slew of other guys. I even got in touch with N.T. Wright back then. I think it's easier to get in touch with him nowadays. But um, it, So I, I was heavily invested in, in defending this uh, the, the, the sola fide of the Reformation. And um, I was there in the, in the thick of the debate between uh, John Piper and N.T. Wright. I don't know if you remember. They yes. had a, a, an exchange of uh, publications with... Uh, Counted Righteous in Christ by Piper. Mm-hmm. Then N.T. Wright wrote a book, um, and the, it called Justification. And then Piper wrote a book on another book on justification. And uh, th- this was a time where I started to realize, well, wait a minute, N.T. Wright has got a point on some things. Now, I mm-hmm. let me just let me just put my cards out. I'm actually not fully convinced of many of the, the new perspectives. Uh, most scholars now talk about in the plural because there's just there's just so many. Um, mm. I I think that they've latched on to some very key items that have that was completely eclipsed by uh, Luther, Calvin, and their exegesis of the of the of Romans, Galatians, Philip, uh, uh, the the letter to Philippi and, and Colossians. I think that the new perspective has is definitely pointed out that taking that eclipse away back and, and shown the light of the original context um, on the whole Judaizer controversy. On the other hand, I think that um, they've become equally as abnormally exclusive as the Lutheran um, introspective conscience of the West, as Crystal Stendhal called it. I think they've also kind of morphed Paul into something that he isn't. Um, but uh, so I, I started to... Uh, move more into something that was already being seen in the 70s, the late 70s with Norman Shepard eventually became the, um, it, it became a, a federal vision ideology. Yeah, I'm sure you're, you're not supposed to with. say, you're not supposed to say Norman Shepard. I know, Shepherd. no, no, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I definitely didn't go along with it, but I was reading the material some of the publications and following out the footnotes and getting bibliography for all these guys. And um, I started to shift my thought on Protestant uh, thinking. And um, I ended up landing in church discipline, actually, at the Reformed Baptist Church I was going to because as a baptismal member, I was I made vows to the London Baptist Confession of, of 1689. And uh, I was definitely coming into conflict with that it wasn't a fully blown like historic catholic patristic doctrine that i was seeing in in the scripture but i was uh, i was influenced by one particular author who made it into the new the the new biblical theology series that was edited by carson yeah um it was a volume that he published called um christ our righteousness by mark seyfried who was uh he at the time he was a baptist a professor at uh, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary over there in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, I, I established a, an email uh, exchange with him going back and forth on the, on the issue of Luther and, and justification. And he introduced a side of Luther that I had not known, um, which is that there is some sense in which Luther talks about a progressive ontological justification. But there's so many different Luthers depending on what year and month <laughs> um, the, you know, that's why now they have the Catholic, early Catholic Luther, the later, yeah. much more forensic type Luther. But uh, Mark Seyfried really set me off on a path to see that this eschatological reality of justification, bringing us into the new creation with Christ's resurrection, that unintentionally tipped me over to seeing justification as involving um a, the interior renewal um, as as a constitutive cause to our being made just in the eyes of God. When I became an Anglican, um, I was an Anglo-Catholic almost instantly, just because of uh, I was already I had already believed in the the Ecumenical Councils, transubstantiation, 
I had already believed the sacrifice of the mass. Um, I was reading Anglo-Catholic authors before I became an Anglican, and I, I just I was mesmerized by their teaching. They didn't they didn't have to stick out their neck for some of the more Romish doctrines, you know. Yeah. Um, but they definitely uh, defended. Roman Catholic doctrine very well um, in soteriological and sacramental theology, as well as like yes. theology proper. Oh, mm -hmm. Francis Hall. I mean, I've, I still, I still have so many of my Anglican books. I you still, know, uh, I still if read you them. if you read uh, Paul's Dogmatics, he actually recommends uh, Hall's volume on the Trinity. That's one of the only Protestants I've ever seen him uh, recommend is Hall. That's crazy. I didn't even know that. That's cool. Um, I like Joseph Reverend, the late, the late Reverend Joseph Paul. He's, he's excellent. Um, I actually utilize him in my book on, cause I think that he, he was extremely perceptive on the um, dogmatic in, in some of the dogmatic debates uh, within the Catholic world on mm -hmm. justification. Cause a lot of people don't realize that within the Catholic world, there's still debates on yes. certain uh, aspects of justification, but um well, when I was an Anglo Catholic, I my mind went to issues of church authority, um, orthodoxy, Constantinople, Byzantium, and that and my research was completely new. Um, I was no longer having like a stack of ten books on soteriology in my house. It would now be on you know history, ecclesiology, and things like that. So I actually took a detour around two thousand twelve, uh, two thousand eleven, two thousand ten, around there. And, uh, and and I, I I I've been basically housed. I pitched my tent basically in ecclesiological matters and church history matters, East West Greek Latin schism. Um, but I came back to this issue about I don't know seven or eight months ago, and I said, you know, I studied that particular issue so much. Maybe I should put pen to paper as to how I came out of the Protestant way of thinking on this matter. So I, I tried to get engaged some of the literature that has been hitherto published. Um, you know, uh, I, re you know, I reached out into the works of, uh, some of the newer faces on, on the scene for, uh, the defending Protestant teaching. And I've realized that so many Protestants have actually conceded some of the things from the new perspective. I'm thinking of guys such as Thomas Schreiner, who initially he was just like, you know, his uh, his boss, Al Mohler um, and uh, James White, you know, very suspicious of N.T. Wright. Um, but then now he's come around to saying, you know, no, he's he's a Christian. He's not a heretic. Um, and you have uh, P.T. O'Brien, Francis, uh, I think Frank V. Elman, um, just a number of Pauline scholars in the past have actually made some adjustments to their thinking. So some of these reform guys today, um, uh, they're, they're open to dialogue on this issue more than they were when I was looking into it. Because when I was looking into it, all swords were out. Um, I think some swords are still out. Um, uh, I think uh, Fesco is is one yes. guy I've looked into. He's, he's still trodden <laughs> the... Uh, the old if, habit. If they if they teach a Westminster West, then uh, then you you know that their swords are going to be out. <laughs> yes, yeah. So, but other authors seem to have come around. You know, I'm thinking of John Barclay, um, who is not he's not fully on the way of new perspective. You know, where with Jimmy Dunn or Wright um, or Richard B Hayes, but he's definitely come around to 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 speak in in terms that. Uh, shows an indirect concession to you know some of the hebrew uh dictums like you know we'll be saved and judged according to our works i think barclay's done a tremendous service with his book on uh, paul and the gift um so i tried to update my thoughts with some of the recent scholarship and i crammed it all in a book and a, a, a small small as i could make it um, and I chose Romans that like like we were talking because um, if we're talking about the debate between Catholics and Protestants, we're talking about a New Testament issue. And if we're talking about justification, 
we're talking about a Romans Galatians issue, but most most especially Romans. And so I just decided to structure my book off the first eight chapters of the of the epistle to the Romans. Okay, so uh, I guess when it comes to Romans itself, who who are your favorite uh, commentators on Romans? Um, ancient, modern, who, who, who do you read? And then uh, it really resonates with you because I know, I know who I read and it resonates with me. Where is it? <laughs> there it is. My, yeah. My, Thomas I my... commentary on Romans. This yeah. is honestly, I was reading this. Um, this was one of the most helpful uh, works. Uh, I read this along with the gloss um, and uh, another, another book. I can't remember. Um, who it was who it was by but uh when i was going through uh, my protestant just uh protestant uh romans classes because i've actually taken two at this point and i would always read them alongside the authors we were reading for that low sigh and uh no nobody beats saint thomas yeah no i have to agree with you i was i was looking around for my uh commentary by aquinas it's always handy it, i feel like it's always an arm's length away from me but we've run we, we redid this shelf so i don't have it here but um yes saint thomas aquinas's commentary on romans is by far my favorite commentary because um it doesn't you know as a protestant if you're going to read aquinas um it doesn't appear to be as exegetically rigorous but if you understand what Aquinas means by his language, boy, I think he was right there in the text with Paul, like right there, understanding exactly what Paul was writing. And uh, it helped in many ways. But besides that, I really enjoy some of the fragments we have from St. Cyril of Alexandria, um, because he definitely shows forth the uh, a strong doctrine of original sin with Romans 5, 12 to 21. And he also shows a, an... Uh, a, a cognizance of the uh, the new birth as being um, sort of the framework for justification um, in his comments on Romans uh, uh, 3 and 6. But we only have fragments, so I, th I think there's an effort out there to try and translate what the, the total fragments we have. Um, besides St. Cyril, I really enjoy St. John Chrysostom, who is another, uh, if we could use the term again, locus classicus for Protestant appeal. Because if you read uh, Chrysostom's commentary on Romans, um, I found myself uh, often, when I was a Protestant, um, thinking, yeah, this is it. You know, this is exactly what Luther said. This is exactly what Calvin said. Yeah. Um, but um, when you start reading more, because he's so dense, uh, Chrysostom, if you just read like, half of his comments you can get that but when you read the whole thing you're like wait a minute he's appealing to this argument he's using this illustration he's using that analogy those don't seem to help the protestant view so i think if you read through a, a chrysostom painfully uh I, it turns into a joy and you start to see that he he's not really teaching the extra nos alien the alien righteousness a uh, forensic justification that luther was talking about although he can really t it almost seems like in some part in some parts he really does think that but i, I think there's an enormous amount of reflection in other and in, in other places within romans um so there's chrysostom um i really uh let, let's get to uh some other ones that uh were done later you know, there's some it, some some of the epistolary interpretations that come out of Augustine are good, um, but that you know it's kind of like passages here and there and sermons, yeah. um, and uh, let's let's get to, you know I actually like um, a Protestant commentator on Romans. His name is uh, Adolf Schlater. Um, I have his book around here somewhere, but he was a he was a 19th century German Lutheran. Uh, New Testament professor. That usually um, is that's usually a very bad sign if they're a nineteenth century German uh, New yes. Testament professor. Yes. So I I was <laughs> I was oh I was hesitant as well. So this was a Tubingen guy. Um but he was famous for being one of the stalwarts against the the new winds of mm -hmm. liberalism and higher criticism and historicism and all that. So he ended up being sort of like a martyr for the conservative Christian view 
of uh, the authenticity of the Bible, the text, the um, and and some of the more basic Christian doctrines that were being called into question. But Adolf Schlater was uh, he was a man committed to sola fide. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. However. Um, he was not beholden to the exegetical decisions from of Luther, Calvin, and company. Mm-hmm. He was he was very faithful to the text, in my opinion, the most faithful I've ever seen a Protestant um, on this issue. And the, for, the what really point what really makes his commentary excellent um, is he, he doesn't see Romans one to five as dealing with justification and then romans 6 to 8 dealing with the distinct though not separable gift of sanctification he he says he says if there was ever anything that the reformation exegesis of romans has done as a disservice to the world it was that and so he understands the righteousness of god being the whole exposition of the dikaios word group from Romans 1 17 all the way to Romans 8 13 where Paul says yeah, the body is dead because of sin but the spirit is life because of righteousness dikaiosunein um he sees the whole dikaiosune word encompassing one single concept from one to eight now he doesn't realize that that helps uh tridentine uh interpretations of 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 paul um but he 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 realized that you know this this could be taken to mean a denial of of sola fide but he he tried to whittle it back in so but i i think you know and slater himself has been resurrected in a lot of protestant thinking today so guys like robert yarborough he's um he's a a professor i can't remember exactly where he teaches it's some it's 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 not one of the big names, but I read um, his commentary on First John. Very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's done excellent work in the Johannine Epi- Johanna epistles. Um, Andreas Kostenberger is another mm-hmm. guy who's he he's done a lot of work on John. Speaking of John, um, but um, both of them have have kind of tried to bring Adolf Slater back into into Protestant reading because he was kind of put down because of how almost Catholic. Uh, his commentary on Romans was. Could, could it could it be because of their um, their experience in the Yoannine uh, literature? Because I've I've always found that when I read, uh, for example, First John, um, and then think about justification, that uh, that, that the, the the Romish interpretation becomes a lot clearer in my eyes when I read First John, and yeah. uh, when I when I read Romans, it usually takes uh, a little bit of uh, help from from uh common uh, commentators i find that i I find that to be uh true because uh like schlater's interpretation of uh, first john where it says if we if we can uh if we love i can't remember exactly how it's going but if we love if we keep his commandments the blood of christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness which means you've got this issue of charity and the the real mm-hmm. ontological blotting out of iniquity being a positive and negative of the same reality, um, I and and Schlater brings that up in his commentary on Romans how the righteousness that justifies us is not only the forensic declaration but it's also the charity that comes out of us and I don't think he realized what kind of shots he was firing at the time but. Um, so, so there's that. We don't want to get too much on Schlater, but if any any of the listeners want to know a, a Protestant commentary that I recommend, it would be Adolf Schlater. Um, one of the guys that has uh, picked up on him too is Peter Stolmacher, who was another Tubingen guy, um, who was a Lutheran, but I think today he's a Quaker, interestingly enough. But uh, he wrote the foreword to Schlater's commentary on Romans, and Stolmacher was also another firebrand um shots firing kind of guy he opposed the new perspective but um he seemed to have have uh hedged away for for people to come out of the the sola fide interpretation of romans 
Um, and then, of course, today you've got some of the standard ones like Douglas J. Moo, I think, is still good. I, I still think that he's got something to offer. Yes. Um, I think that um, uh, uh, who's the who's the guy who's writing now? I, I, I think I quote Gorman, Michael, Michael Gorman, um, the, the Christiformity uh, motif and Paul. He's written quite a bit on the, uh, the 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 doctrine of justification and theosis and Paul. He recently published a, a commentary on Romans. Um, I don't agree with everything in it. It's, it seems like he's far more into like the social application of it. You know, like some of these newer interpreters, they're like, well, Paul, all Paul's talking about is how to get people back at the table. Um, so they, they see too much of a social significance. And I, I try to get weary. I get weary of that because we're, Paul sees justification as encompassing the whole panorama of salvation. Um you know, human beings, Adam, death, resurrection, life of the world to come type of thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I could go on, man. There's just, but those are some of the highlighting, uh, highlighted uh, commentators that I've appreciated. Yeah. And um, just the, the question that's forefront in my mind and forefront in Protestant minds when they, when they do read the book of Romans is why is, one faith uh, mentioned alone. Uh, faith, faith is mentioned to the uh, to the exclusion of any other uh, modification, and then also that faith is also uh, with with that mention of faith is usually negated works. So everybody everybody always asks about that. So I figured I'd just uh, just yeah. put it out there and see see what you'd say. Yeah. So this is something I bring out in my introduction. Um, which is one of the things that Protestants need to understand um, is something that they've already themselves come to emphasize in the Pauline scholarship of the last 30 years. And that is that the major structure of Paul's theology, um, you know, some people say it's the kingdom, um, but the major structure of Paul's theology, the major theme or motif or whatever, however you want to phrase it, is the, 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 fa the fact that with the redemptive events of Christ's incarnation, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, the life that was expected to come in Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, the life of the resurrected Israel, has broken into the here and into the now. And through baptism or through joining, you know, some of the, the Greek is ice, you know, ice, Jesus Christo, meaning we believe into Jesus Christ, united into Christ. We actually become conjoined to Christ in his own experience. So in other words, you know, Protestant interpreters have have done a lot of the substitutionary um, mechanics of Paul. This is what Christ did for us. This is what he did, you know, in our place. But with guys like Lad, Voss, Ritterboss, and uh, uh, one guy I think that might still be at Westminster, Richard B. Gaffin, um, mm -hmm. brought out is what is Christ, what is it that we're doing with Christ together in him? And all of salvation is our walking through this door that separates the old creation and the new creation, or the old humanity and the new humanity. And so everything of, everything of our salvation is entering into this major structure of the new genesis of mankind. So if, if salvation is a new genesis of mankind, then that means that there's nothing we can physically do to really effect it. You know, as Paul says, not the circumcision made without hands, you know, contrasting a circumcision with hands or uh, celebrating the Feast of Booths or the, 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 the you know, certain ritual identity markers um, that, pertain to ethnic Israel. All those things are within human tangibility. They're within the human grasp. But for Paul, we've entered the new creation. And so 
everything we do in, in, in this realm can't be rooted into what Paul calls the works paradigm. In other words, in Romans 1, Paul says, what did Abraham, our forefather, find according to the flesh? Well, he found nothing according to the flesh. It doesn't matter what he did. Not Nothing of what Abraham did was according to the flesh that, 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 that saved him, right? Mm -hmm. So what we have to understand is that uh, faith, obedience, works, sanctification, struggle, suffering, all those things in Paul, none of those are works in the sense of they are operating from the natural capacity of man, you know? And so it, it, if we can understand that, then we can finally get past these debates on, oh, you're saying that we're justified by our obedience. So that's, that's bringing us back to the old boasting, you know, thumb under our overall straps, you know, rocking back and forth on a rocking chair saying, oh, you know, maybe justification was free. So I can't take glory for that. But sanctification, oh, I'm going to take what's mine. No, that, that, that's not possible in, in, in Paul's theology. And, and that's because works in the sense of natural human capacity, that's excluded from justification and sanctification. The good works of a Christian are, are operating off of a much different principle. The divine, the divine, uh, it's the divine principle of God who's working in us and through us you know, scholastics did all kinds of good work in trying to explain that. Um, and, and so when Paul's talking about the exclusion of works, really what he's excluding is the the life context of Adam and Adamic humanity. So justification apart from that, sanctification apart from that, um, does not necessarily mean inactivity. It means it, it definitely means activity because Paul even says in Romans six, before you were before you were saved, you were free in regard to righteousness, but then you obeyed from the heart the teaching to which you were delivered. Okay, you were set free from sin. Romans six uh, one to twenty three. That he's definitely talking about human activity. There we have to put to death the deeds of the flesh, otherwise we won't have life, not a certain degree of life but life itself, you know? So I, I, I very much think that it's important to understand that structure, that major structure that for Paul, everything hinges on this transition from Adam to Christ, old world to new world, um, old Genesis to new Genesis, you know, old Adam to new Adam. And when you can understand that, um, then you understand that nothing, it has to be a work of God, just like we had nothing to do with our first, you know, Adam was made from the dust, right? Well, we were made from the, the tomb. So every, when Paul talks about powers, this goes back to Romans 1 16, the gospel is the power of God to salvation. And then he taught, he reasons from that, the dikaiosune deu, the, the righteousness of God. Well, what is power in Paul? Dunamus. It's not just that God's handiwork, the power that he, you know, the power that he has, generally speaking, to uphold all things. No, he's talking about the power that he exerted into the corpse of Jesus in the tomb of St. Joseph Arimathea. And that brought out a completely new form of human existence, the glorified new man. Okay. That's the kind of power that's justifying power. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, it's apart from works, but in another sense, it totally involves the new human activity that comes out of it. So, like, like Paul says, so too you must walk in newness of life. Okay. That newness of life. That's not just a return to the works of the law. <laughs> you know, it, and it, it, ironically for Paul, he says being under grace and this new slavery are the link. They link up, you know. So I think that if you can understand that major structure and those themes in Paul, it really does. A, it gets us past 
some of these things that you, you know, guys like John Owen and Edwards, they were so close to seeing all they had to do was make certain adjustments to their thinking and they would have gotten the Catholic. The, the, the Catholic yeah. I've, Catholic. I've, um, the, one of the few things that I've learned from second, uh, second temple Judaism is all the rage nowadays when it comes yep. to interpreting things. But one of the few things that I've, I've gathered from, uh, that study, uh, that I've, that I've continued to find use for, is the concept of new birth in Second Temple Judaism that when somebody uh, is is received as a, pros, a proselyte into Judaism, uh, they they are regarded as a new person in the sense that all of their former relations, even even their former relations, are completely destroyed. Like there's uh, there are certain judgments in the Talmud that people who are brought uh, as prosel uh, proselytes in. Uh, they are they they could uh, like the consing uh, consanguinity laws don't even apply, so they could technically marry their sister, because they are a completely new person and all of their former relations are removed. And in this in this uh, similar way, that in baptism, uh, there there is truly new life. That everything before is actually destroyed, and you are actually a new person. So that is why our our former sins are not imputed to us. And then in a, in a very real sense, we're already we. Um, we are are already uh, fused that new life too, in where uh, not only are our former relations removed, but we are actually uh, brought into that to, to the fullness of that life. Yes, yes, and, and, and I'm not, it's very rare that somebody can understand that in the debates today, because um, when we think of like the remission of sins or the expiation of sin in Christ's blood, um, it's not always understood that that forgiveness comes through regeneration and that's because our old selves are literally buried with the corpse of jesus it's gone you know um and so forgiveness comes about through the resurrection where we're actually new entities that's an ontological transition that's not just that's not god saying well you did something really bad but then somebody did something really good for you so now i don't need to really consider it anymore no 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 we're talking about like you're a new entity and so you know ontologically that's why your sins are blotted out okay i had um let's see what questions i would i would like to ask so when you get to the beginning of Romans six, somebody somebody asks this. Uh, if you ever heard of um, Goy for Jesus, he's a he's a Protestant YouTuber. He he, he always he always tries to catch uh, Roman Catholics on this, and I, and I know how I would answer, but I've, I'm very curious to see how you would answer. So the beginning of Romans six, it starts. Uh, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And what he asks is he asks. If, if Roman Catholic theology um, concerning justification is true, and if our reading of Romans 1 through 5 is, is correct, how then do we receive that anticipated uh, objection, since it would seem more in accord with a Protestant reading of 1 through 5 uh, to receive that objection, not a Catholic reading of 1 through 5? Yeah, good question. So this person... Um... Uh, uh, I think it's a goy for Jesus. I've I've yes. been sent a video where they were they were like reviewing something I did, and um, I uh, I kind of went into the chat and said I'd love to you know dialogue or something. I couldn't stay long. I could rarely stay on these chats. I just don't ever have the time. But um, so I know who you're talking about. Um, this question of his is a very good one. Um, and let me just say off the bat, it's it's a it's a reasonable it's it's not without rationality, you know. Um, it's one of the stronger points that uh, Protestants have made historically. But what I would respond in short, and, and I've already brought this up in an article I wrote on First Clement, because in many ways, First Clement, Saint Clement of Rome. He actually does the same thing. He talks about justification, you know, a, a workless justification by faith and grace. And then afterwards he says, well, then should we just grow lazy and doing good because we're justified? 
Um, Clement is a different one, but I've written on on that. If you could look it up on my blog, um, what I would say here in Romans six is that Paul, Paul is his the word righteousness. If we could just erase this chapter division between five and six, um, the dikaya sune sunain and the sunu or sunis um, distinction. Um, it evaporates. You see, so the righteousness that we are born into through the second Adam in Romans 5, 12 to 21, and which justifies us and which prepares us for eternal life, that's not different than the righteousness that Paul brings up in Romans 6. I mean, hardly anybody's going to use the same word like that within such a close proximity and have like a such a distinctive difference that Protestants want to push on justifying righteousness and sanctifying righteousness. You know, if we're talking in systematic categories, okay, that's number one. I would say there's already an antecedent improbability that Paul's got such a different meaning to dikaiosune in Romans 5, and then literally just a couple, you know, a few lines down. Um, whatever, you know, 15 seconds of talking to the scribe that he's got this different meaning that's such a, a systematically important difference um, that makes up the Reformed confessions. I just, that's, it's antecedently improbable. The other thing I'd like to say is that Paul's making a, a historical inference. He just talked about why the law of Moses was given. OK, so if we get out of the issue of, you know, well, Christ paid it all. So now why why do we have to do anything? That's not really what Paul's getting at here. Paul is Paul is still invested in this conversation about the Sinai administration. That's that's what he's talking about. The Before the law, right? Romans 512. If we go back to Romans 512, he talks about um, he says, uh um, or, or 13, for until the law, sin was in the world. For until the law, what does he mean by law there? Namas is definitely referring to the Sinai uh, Deuteronomic law, you know? And and so he's thinking in terms of history. Then in Romans 5.20, um, he brings it back up. He says, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound okay so we gotta we gotta just pause there okay paul's really invested in this conversation about mount sinai that's really what he's talking about here because when in his discussions in the synagogues this is this is he's talking about a historical issue with the law of moses the law entered that the offense might abound so the, so th this came across uh, to, as to many of the high IQ Jews of his day as Paul's teaching that the law was given so that um, that we might do evil. <laughs> um, and in other places, Paul has to clarify, no, that's not what he's saying. But he is saying, in a sense, that when the law came in, it had this... this um, function to sort of enhance sin to transgressions um so i know that i mean we can get into the debates on this is such a vast amount of literature on this but paul is really saying that the that the sinai covenant was given in order that both our awareness and in a sense that transgressions might be seen as multiplied Right. So Paul is giving a redemptive historical function to the law of Moses that sounds like he's saying it's a killing machine. Now, Romans seven, he'll have to clarify that. No, no, no. It's good, holy and good. You know, it's, it's just holy and good. OK, but because of who we are, OK, because of what we are in Adam, the law of Moses came in, the Ten Commandments came in and had this, this multiplicative function of transgressions. 
But then what was the purpose of that? That wasn't the primary purpose. That wasn't the final end. The final end was this. He says, um, but where sin abounded, right? Sin went on the increase. Where sin abounded um, so that sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through justification to eternal life. So in other words, you've got this redemptive historical um, cause and effect. So you've got that the the rain, the increase of sin, the increase of death, um, just so that it gets swallowed up by this historical intervention in Christ, bringing grace. The law is done away with, in comes the grace of the new covenant. So, so Paul's talking about a historical thing here. So the question is, well, Paul, if, if God gave the law in order to increase sin, in order that he might show his grace more, why don't we just perpetuate that cause and effect? You see? So it's not, it's not about, uh, it's not about, oh, the, the righteousness through Christ basically does everything for us so now why won't we why do what do we what else do we have to do in order to be saved that's not what he's saying what he's saying is if god is in the business of giving commandments in order to increase guilt and increase sin just to, just so that he could return grace well that kind of business transaction well why don't we just continue that that's what paul's trying to say so in answer to that Paul says, no, the very righteousness, the very grace that he had just been talking about is transformative. Okay, so that's why he answers it in that way. Okay, so that's 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 how I interpret Romans six in that transition. Um, and I think that that comports well with his thought, especially on the law, because then he comes right back to it in Romans six, eleven to 14. For you are not under the law but under grace. Well, it makes it makes perfect sense as a Lutheran and a Calvinist to read that because law is just law. You're under the law, that means we're under the, you're under 16th century medieval Roman Catholicism. But for Paul, under the law had a very strictly um, historical uh, nationalistic uh, understanding. So under grace definitely means the new dispensation. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm trying to think of somebody sent me a lot of questions, and I'm trying to uh, think of which one would be the best. Trying Protestants trying to trick you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, hmm. but it's see. a good objection. I mean, I'm not trying to take anything away from a, a mm. goy for Jesus. I'm not trying to denigrate his uh, the strength of his point. So this is this is a fun one. I think I know how I would answer this one too, but uh, I will. I'll ask it. How is inherent righteousness the meritorious cause um, of our justification in light of its imperfection? Oh, that's a great question. That's a great question. So, um, it, you know, the first thing that um, the first thing that I would say here is that when we're talking about merit, you know. Um, we're, 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 we're talking about what is it that, what is it that really earned uh, the, the meritorious grounds, you know, in scholastic thinking, the meritorious cause, you know, um, but today it seems like more Protestants are just using the word grounds. Um, we're not talking about something that's inherent within us. Okay. When we're talking about what's inherent in us. We're talking about something that's effective from the meritorious cause it also serves as another kind of cause which is form to matter so you've got formal a form that's put put into shape but that's an effect of a prior meritorious cause so what is the meritorious cause in uh catholic theology well it's the death of jesus it's it's the it's mm. it's the it's the it's the uh it, it i mean i don't mean literally like the collapse of his oxygen levels and all that. I'm talking about the 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 loving sacrifice and meritorious um, charity that the Son of God had for his Father on behalf of the human race. 
which ended up in violent death. You know, that sacrifice was the meritorious cause of our justification. In other words, he 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 fought hard. You know, he 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 gave all his energy in his it, through his human nature to love his father and to love humankind, and the earnings for that victory are eternal life for his own body. So he he merited for himself, like Aquinas talks about. Um, he merited for himself everlasting glory. But because we get we get plugged into his body through baptism, all the riches that he earned through his own obedience redounds to all of his body members. Now, when it comes to us as a body member, now we're talking about the effect, right? What is the effect of this meritorious cause? Well, now we're talking about different kinds of causes. Efficiency, we could talk about the instrumentality of how it gets to us. But this, this inherent righteousness that we get when, when finally being plugged into the body of Christ through baptism and all the riches come from the head down to all the body members, now we're talking about the form that it takes and that's that's the inherent righteousness that we have in in justification now is that imperfect or is it is it perfect or imperfect well in the first place uh let's just talk about infants right because in, infant soteriology really kind of uh makes clarity of things that adult soteriology doesn't always do and in, how is an infant justified in catholic theology well, an infant is justified in catholicology because of the habit, the habitus that we receive, mm -hmm. um, which is the uh, the theological virtues, meaning they 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 dispose us to God. So, the infusion of faith, um, hope, and love, charity, and love, um, what that does is it re it brings back the original harmony that. Uh, human beings were originally constituted with, with some caveats, okay? So it's not like we're returning exactly to the way Adam was made. But original sin is sort of ontologically blotted out. And what does that mean? Okay, in Aquinas, original sin is a disruption of the harmony theologically and anthropologically. So there's a harmony between God and the intellect, so the intellect adheres, here, adheres to God, and the body adheres to the intellect. Okay, the lower appetites adheres to the intellect. So you've got the body being submissive to the mind, and the mind being submissive to God. That's the harmony of original righteousness. Well, original sin uh, takes the intellect away from harmony with uh, with with God, and and the the lower appetites actually are no longer submissive to the intellect, and so really what's driving us in through our passions and sins is the body. So, receiving the righteousness of God in baptism, what ends up happening is it reorders man and sets him as prepared to live for God as Paul says in Romans 7, that we might bear fruit to God. Um, is it perfection? Well, it's not an activity yet, right? Because a baby doesn't do any activities. Mm -hmm. So we have to distinguish between the, um, the habit or the habitus, the disposition, the ontological state of grace, and the subsequent activity that a human does with the will and the intellect. Now that the question is, is that going to be sufficient? You know, this goes back to the debates on on whether you know covenant theology and whether God needs a vicarious obedient life in order for us to be justified. Catholics don't believe that. We don't believe that in order to be justified in God's sight, somebody else has to live a full career of righteousness from from birth to death. Because uh, that's what they, that's the covenant theology is constructed in the sense where somebody's got to be born, somebody's got to be obedient through childhood, they've got to be obedient through adulthood, all the way to their final breath, okay, and pass the trial. And then once that's achieved, that act of obedience um, in death, then that can somehow become 
uh, forensically um, attributed to as if I lived his life. And that, that's the only way I can be justified. So that's kind of in the background of somebody who's going to ask this question that you're asking. We would not accept that. We, we would actually go back to what some of the convictions of the earlier reformers were, where the remission of sins is, is, is re- that is justification. Because the remission of sins is also, on the positive side, this infusion of justice. Mm-hmm. Okay? So we don't think, you know, so we don't think that you would need to have this full life of obedience attributed to us in order to be just in God's eyes. We just need to be changed. And and God, God covers the rest, you know, through the propitiatory sacrifice of Jesus, all of our guilt is obliterated. So there's no longer any charges with which we need to answer for, eternally speaking. Okay? And we're, we're prepared for the glory to come. That's all that's necessary for justification. So you have that in an infant who didn't even do anything yet. And mm-hmm. you have it in an adult. You have it inside of an adult who's just baptized, but then subsequently the will and the intellect are cooperating with grace in order to, in order to be pleasing to God. That's another debate that, you know, that Protestants and Catholics can spend hours on. And what does it mean for our works to be pleasing to God? I think Aquinas really got the, the drop on, on um, Luther with this, in this regard. We really do have the ability to please God in an authentic way and not in all the cav- not with all the qualifications that you typically will see in um, the book of Concord and some of the you know and uh, the institutes of the Christian religion now we're talking about a real righteous activity that we can do um, through the grace of God and um, so to, to get to the heart of the matter we believe different things about what what's needed to be just in God's eyes. The reform guy thinks that we need from birth to death a perfect life attributed to us, you know, through forensic imputation. Anything less than that, they don't they, they don't even think that we have a way to get justified. Okay. Mm-hmm. But interestingly enough, that, that shows up nowhere in the exegesis of Paul. You know, in fact, this is something that Calvin uh, understood early on in his commentaries on Romans. Romans six Romans 4, 6 to 8, Paul, uh, Paul goes to Psalm 32, and he says, just as David talks about the man to whom God imputes righteousness, so that's, that's a position, that's a positive, uh, just as David speaks of the man to whom God, or the, the, yeah, the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works, and then he lists a guy who's got his sins forgiven. So, in other words, you don't have this negative, positive bifurcation in Paul. That's the thing that covenant theologians have, where if your sins are forgiven, that only takes care of the negative side. But then you need this vicarious life lived out in your place. And without that, you're not justified. That, that's not in Paul. That, that's not in Paul. For him, the forgiveness of sins is the recognition of righteousness, because the forgiveness of sins is the negative side of the same reality whose positive is the infusion of justice. Again, that gets into more debates, but that's mm-hmm. just, I, I don't know how to answer it in any yeah. shorter way. Yeah, with uh, <clears throat> actually my favorite, many people would not expect this, but my favorite theologian when it comes to justification, ready for it? I want to see. St. John of the Cross. Oh, really? His living flame of love. I'm going to read a passage from this right now because I think this perfectly encapsulates. Go ahead. I've um, never, the, I've never read it, so go ahead. Living, living flame of love. Everybody out there, you should read Saint John of the Cross. He's my patron. He is amazing. So it says, "This flame of love is the spirit of the bridegroom, who is the Holy Spirit. The soul feels him within itself, not only as a fire that has consumed and transformed it, but as a fire that burns and flares within it. As I mentioned, in that flame, every time it flares up." bathes the soul in glory and refreshes it with the quality of divine life. Such is the activity of the Holy Spirit and the soul transformed in love. The interior acts he produces shoots up flames, for they are acts of inflamed love. 
in which the will of the soul united with that flame, made one with it, loves most sublimely. Thus these acts of love are most precious. One of them is more meritorious and valuable than all the deeds of a person may have performed in the whole life without this transformation, however great they may have been. The same difference lying between a habit and an act lies between the transformation in love and the flame of love. It is like the difference between the wood on fire and the flame leaping up from it. For the flame is the effect of the fire present uh, there. We can compare the soul in its ordinary condition in this state of transform transformation of love to the log of wood that is ever immersed in flame in fire and the acts of the soul to the flames that blazes up from the fire of love the more intense the fire of union the more vehemently does this fire burst into flames the acts of the will are united to this flame and ascend carried away and absorbed in the flame of the holy spirit just as the angel mounted to god in the flame of Manoah's sacrifice. Thus, in this state, the soul cannot make acts because the soul makes them all, the Holy Spirit makes them all, and moves it towards them. As a result, all the acts of the soul are divine, since both the movement to these acts and their execution stem from God. Mm. I think I think that section honestly uh, clinches it, because the way we view sanctifying grace when it comes to sanctifying grace being a certain created participation in the divine life, the fact that all of uh, all of the works of grace which we have, works of nature, obviously, uh, any works of natural virtue, whether it be uh, fortitude, justice, any of any of these works of natural virtue can come from uh, from, from our own will, uh, unaided by grace. But with sanctifying grace, it infuses that that flame into the soul, where where the soul. Um, is transformed in, into that, that fiery log. And that is, that is those habits which are infused into the soul, the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. And then from that flames up um, those acts that we have, acts of charity. So it's imperfect, not because of any sort of imperfection in the sanctifying grace itself. The grace is perfect, but it's imperfect because of the disposition of matter to receive form. It's imperfect because uh, because uh, it's it, the subjectivity in which it's in which it's infused. Mm -hmm. It's I imperfection in the log, not imperfection in the fire. Yeah, that 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 wood to fire dynamic there is exactly what I'm trying to to say here is that. Um, it reminds me of what St. Augustine also said on uh, God rewarding his own gifts, you know, where mm -hmm. God God infuses into us justice and the grace to perform. Um, and then whenever we merit something, it's really just as if the painter, you know, m painting his canvas, you know, he's rewarding his own hand because he's working through us like as if we're the paintbrush. Um you know, obviously all analogies fall apart, but um, the, the concept here is, is definitely what you're saying. The imperfection is within the log, but because of this principle that's added to it, um, and the effect of it is is what God is looking at and saying that is goodness. You know? And I think and I think these these descriptions of um, of somebody somebody commented um I'm late here, but John, uh, your article on John Henry, Henry Newman on justification, that's my article, is really good. That's that's something that people have always really enjoyed, that article right there. I, I always get comments about that article, is people telling me, I loved your article on John Henry Newman. It made me read uh, St. Newman's work on lectures of justification. Yeah. And I think the best um, of our tradition when it comes to writing about justification that I've read are these people like St. Thomas Aquinas, who always kept union with Christ in in in, in right in front of their eyes yes. the entire time, and thinking of thinking of uh, sanctifying grace, especially in in view of theosis, mm -hmm. and Saint John of the Cross does a wonderful job of that. So we have some questions here. I'm going to go up. There's only a few. Okay, so if Mister Yabara takes any questions, he does, I guess. How does your new book compare to Dr. Syngenesis, Not by Faith Alone? This is the main work I have on the topic of justification. Okay, so, um, well, it's extremely shorter. 
This um, is like 800 pages. <laughs> yes, it's like 800 pages. And um, I think it's a great book. I recommend Sid Genesis' book. I do. Um, but I, I think that he was he was thirsty to explain more than needed to be um, in many ways. Um, maybe the structure of the book is a little bit uh, kind of you can kind of get lost easy in his book. Um, whereas my book, I try to I try to go into an exegetical investigation, right, to see if Paul is actually um, thinking the way that tr the, the scholastics and the Tridentine um, bishops were thinking when they constructed the, the doctrine of justification. Um, obviously, there's a huge bridge to connect Paul, the Jew, to, you know, Aquinas and, and the Council of Trent. Um, but I, I try to show that the logical and the conceptual framework and, and argument that Paul's making in Romans 1 to 8, literally the table of contents are Romans 1 to 8, just breaks it up into pieces. Um, it, I think it shows that in Paul's own language, um, what's traceable is not the Protestant teaching. It's the Catholic, and um, it's the Catholic teaching. Yeah. Okay, so when it's time, I want to know his thoughts on the reforms duplex justitia, as it uh, as it compares to ecumenical comes to ecumenical dialogue on this topic. Yeah, so that's a good question, you know, because Luther and the reformers they all understood that there's you know. Uh, an aspect of the righteousness of God that justifies us. And then there's the participatory righteousness um, that we have ontologically. Obviously, Calvin um, was uh, a man who was devoted to understanding union with Christ as essential. He, sanctification was not like a, a righteousness of man, right? Following the righteousness of God. Um, but I, I would say that if if we can so here here's a distinction i bring out in my book that might be helpful i distinguish and i get this from joseph pohl i distinguish between active justification and habitual justification now the habit of justification okay that gets augmented okay through through cooperation of the will and, and the intellect being drawn to God and the will performing activities. But the act of justification is that moment where we're translated from a child of Adam to a son of God. And in the, in the Council of Trent, um, Paul, Paul directs our attention there, where it defines justification as this translation, which is a momentary act. It's not a progressive um augmenting reality you know because later on in the council of trent we talk about the increase of justice following um scholastic talk on on the inhering justice that gets increased or or could you could decrease um the act of justification is that momentary translation where we are literally um translated ontologically from adamic human existence to christic human existence and and that is not a progress that is not a th that's not something that gets like you can gradually increase it it's momentary it's singular it just happens at a moment in time well that moment okay is kind of comparable to what that that instantaneous righteousness that that the reformers talk about being imputed to us, okay? Then, you know, in Catholic theology, the act of justification results in the habit, those in, those virtues that get installed into the human, install is not the right word, but infused into um, our, our being, okay? That gets in, augmented through our will, our, co our cooperation with grace. Well, that is comparable to the the sanctifying righteousness you know that that uh that luther and calvin want to emphasize is necessary as well so there is a way to talk about 
sort of like a an olive branch to the Catholic view, where the reformers and the Protestant teaching today is still going to miss out, is that they still want to make justification sealed into the imputative righteousness. And they don't want to see anything inherent in the soul as constituting any kind of cause to one's justification before God. And, and that's really, it, it really goes back to that. And, and Catholics say, yes, I argue in the book that that's the historic interpretation. I mean, I look at, you look at Chris, like some of the main characters from the fathers, like Hilary of Poitiers, um, Chrysostom, Ambrose, Cyril of Alexandria, Augustine. A lot of these guys, some of the Lutheran patristic scholars in the 17th century, obviously Chemnitz does this in his examination of the Council of Trent. They try to find sola fide in these fathers. And obviously, you know, Chemnitz is not dumb. He, he understands that there's differences. But um, I show that they're completely different on the matter Um and uh, on their commentaries on Genesis 15.6, their commentaries on Habakkuk 2.4, and their commentaries on Romans 4, uh, 1 through 6. Um, so I think that's that's going to be where it comes short on the, the you know, the, those two kinds of righteousness. Okay, thank you. Let me see. Oh, could you go over that list of church fathers again? Because somebody just asked for any church fathers who focus on justification. You just gave a list. So, you know, that's that's interesting. A focus on justification, that's going to be tough. Um, obviously, if you read Chrysostom's commentary on Romans and Galatians, you'll see, uh, you know, read his commentary on 2 Corinthians 5.21. Um, you'll see a lot of justification talk Um and Rome, his commentary on Romans, you don't need to read all of the commentary. Just read uh, chapter 1, chapter 3, his comments on chapter 4, 5, and then um, and then you could read chapter not, uh, Romans 9, 30 to Romans 10, 15. You read Chrysostom on those verses, you'll see uh, a lot of justification talk. Um, if you go to St. Cyril of Alexandria, Fragments in Romans, you'll have to find some literature on this. The ancient Christian commentary series on Romans, you can you can get some of the statements of Cyril on on Paul's letter. Um, you've also got uh, letters and the letters and sermons of uh, oh no, it's the, it's the letters of Ambrose. He talks he he goes into Rome and then some of his commentaries on Genesis. I mean, there's just a lot of literature. My book really details all of the bibliography you need. Um, but Ambrose, then you've got. Uh, Chrysostom also has other commentaries, too, where he brings up justification. Hilary of Poitiers, um, he, has a, he has a commentary on Matthew. He brings up issues related to justification. Um, he's also got some other commentaries. Uh, Hilary of Poitiers brings up Abraham's justification in his De Trinitate, books 10 and 11. Um, I give you the citations in my book. So if you want to see some of what Hillary has to say, uh, Augustine, you could read, um, just go to New Advent. You just read the whole, you know, read uh, the uh, the remission of sins and the, uh, yeah, so on the remission of sins and the infant baptism. You've got that one. You've got uh, the spirit and the letter. Um, ugh, boy, so at least some of these things I used to be able to just throw off the top of my head. But New Advent, New Advent, go to Augustine. You'll see, you'll see the titles. You'll see where you have to, to read to get Augustine talking about Romans. Um, it's it's interspersed, so it's not like he devotes a whole commentary to Romans, unfortunately. Um, I think that covers it. I think that covers the the primary people. I mean, Victor Rhinus is another one that sometimes the Protestants point to, but he's not really a saint, and um, his... his uh, his thinking is is kind of overshadowed by some mm -hmm. of the other fathers that I talked about. Somebody asked for a link to my John Henry Newman article. I just linked that below. If somebody wants to read that. So for so this is I, I'll take this as the representative um, Protestant response because this always this is always going to come up for Calvin Zanke at all. And uh, Zanke's an interesting one to have next to Calvin, but uh, 
Justification is inseparable from union with Christ, which is mystical, participatory, legal, fleshly, and spiritual. So basically, uh, the the objection runs. Uh, Eric, you are you are being extremely unfair to to uh, our classical Protestant modes of thinking about justification, because obviously we we do not have it separate from union with Christ, um, uh, this the certain uh, participation in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, uh, the the work of the Holy Spirit. You, you're being very unfair to to us. So how would you respond to that? Well, just in my introduction, I basically say just that that you know a, a number of the of, a number of uh, false misrep a number of misrepresentations that um, that Catholics are infamous for doing um, is thinking that you know sola fide means that you know justification is all there is, and then you know good works are somehow unnecessary or something like that. And I, I kind of dispel that mythology, you know, and I point out this issue right here. Um, and I even point readers to beyond Calvin to some some of the more late later uh, commentators like uh, John Murray, uh, Redemption Accomplished and Applied, where he takes union as the major structure that takes everything from election or foreknowledge, election all the way to future glorification. So the issue here is not, the inseparability you know we all understand that the protestant reformers held that uh, union with christ and underneath that umbrella justification sanctification adoption uh the remission of sins all those things are are uh, necessarily conjoined okay so that's not the debate here the debate here is what form does justification take place as it is inside the person? Uh, what is the cause of justification in that formal sense? This is where it's different. And this is where we would argue that this, you know, that just as much as Calvin wants to talk about inseparability, he wants to talk about the necessary distinction between justification and sanctification. I mean, for goodness sake, that's what the whole debate was about, you know, in, in a sense. Um, R.C. Sproul's book, uh, By Faith Alone, emphasizes this, this very point, that um, the, the, if, if, if they want to say that it's inseparable, that's one thing, but they're, they're introducing a foreign distinction between justification and sanctification. And so that's where my book really goes to. It, it tries to show out, show forth that justification, okay, and sanctification are not as rigidly and hermetically sealed in a distinction, however much they're inseparable, being underneath the larger umbrella of union. Is that justified based from Paul? And I would argue no, it's not. For, for for Paul, the gift of justification is the, is both the for remission of sins on the negative side and on the positive side, it's the interior renewal of the human person and the progressive life that we have as we put to death the deeds of the Spirit and so so to the Holy Spirit or put to, put to death the deeds of the flesh and so to the Spirit by doing good. OK, that's what Paul means by justification. So if that's what Paul means by justification, then the reformers were wrong to emphasize inseparability. But then this rigid distinction between justification and sanctification. And he asked uh, he asked a second question, but I think uh, he asked, can you clarify in the Roman Catholic view of righteousness by which we are justified is not solely Christ, but partially our own? And how is boasting excluded in the Roman Catholic view of justification? I think if you just uh, I don't know if you were here for that, because I know people go in and out. But if you just go back up to the discussion of uh, of St. John of the Cross's uh, living flame of love and the comments you gave before and after that, that's really helpful because uh it, it's it's a both and it's Christ's righteousness, but it's also our righteousness. It is it is that flame which inflames us, um, and, and that flame is the again is the Holy Spirit, but it's uh, 
it's a creative participation in the Holy Spirit, which is um, which is inherent in our soul. And we can't really boast about uh, that sanctifying grace, which is uh, coming uh, without, uh, but it is inherent within. Yeah, that's good. Uh, and I, I would just say to the last question, how is boasting excluded? Um, exactly what uh, Christian just said. Uh, but also, if you read the end of Romans 2, um, Paul talks about the contrast between the circumcised man and the uncircumcised man. He says the circumcised man who doesn't fulfill the law, circumcision is no good to him. But then the, circum the uncircumcised man who fulfills the righteous decree of the law, the righteous requirement of the law, you know, his uncircumcision is 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 counted as circumcision and then he immediately goes into this issue for for the true jew meaning this the the, the man he just described the true jew is not who, one who is outwardly in the flesh okay whose praise is from men in a sense but one who's inwardly by the holy spirit okay whose praise is from god so what Paul's telling us there is that even the transformative activity of the true Jew is not a, a, a means for illegitimate human boasting. It's all thanks to God. Okay, that's good. I don't see any more questions. Do you have any final comments? Yeah, just, um, you know, there's a number of things we didn't get into, and that's fine because th that's why the book's there. We don't always want to just give out all the details, right? Exactly. But, um, I really go into the historic um, and the modern debates on Paul's usage of Habakkuk 2.4 and Genesis 15.6. Uh, because those are the two passages that really that that Paul looks to to really justify um, his teaching on justification. And I, I argue that the historic and the exegetical and the Hebrew, the Hebraic interpretation of those verses um, really points to the Catholic view. You know, the church fathers and, and even right reason throw that in there to satisfy mm. <laughs> satisfy the Protestants. Um, so, yeah, this is an extremely exegetical work. And I, I appeal to a lot of the, the 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 major names, even in the modern landscape. So um, get the book, even if you don't agree with it. It's only 150 pages. Just tell me what you think. Somebody had a very important question before you go. Yeah. Does Eric prefer prefer a shawarma or falafel? <laughs> shawarma, shawarma, definitely. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what either of those. Not are. today, though. Not today. We're. <laughs> oh yes, yes. We're having. Uh, I think the wife is making shrimp pasta for dinner. So we always yeah, always have we always we have a lot dish. of shrimp shrimp pasta on Fridays. That's that's a go to for us. <laughs> okay, thank you, Eric, and everybody watching. Uh, thank you for watching. Remember, if you want to be really nice, patreoncom slash Thomas. Just just putting that out there because there's a lot of good stuff I do. I did a video the other day on the senses of scripture. And going over some of the um, some of the the heavy technical stuff behind uh, a lot of the ways in which we use language and how it relates as, as signs signifying things and things signifying things and and all that fun stuff. And then also, uh, if you if you need a little help uh, understanding some of the dogmatic aspects of justification, uh, if you go to christianbwagner.com/shop, I do uh, edit and reprint a few theological manuals. Uh, Copens would be particularly helpful here. Uh, Father Hunter and his outlines of dogmatic uh, theology would be very helpful here. They both work off a of pole, so they're kind of pole in miniature, I guess you could say. And uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you, everybody. And remember, it is Trinity Tide, so we worship one God in Trinity, and Trinity in Unity. Lord,